how to pick the right publishing option. Now, if you absolutely know you want to self-publish, you can skip this and go to the next step and get started. If you're unsure how you want to publish a book, whether you want to use self, traditional, or hybrid, this is the module you need to watch. What I'll do in this module is walk you through exactly what each type of publishing option is, how they work, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each, and how to choose the right one for you. So in modern publishing, there are basically three models. There's traditional, there's hybrid, and there's self-publishing. Now I'm gonna walk you through each one. So let's start with traditional. What traditional is, is when most people think of publishing, that's what they think of as book publishing, as traditional. Generally what happens is, an author has to find a book agent. Traditional publishing houses, you know, people like, or companies like HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, uh, Random House, Hachette, et cetera. There's about five major ones, and there's maybe another 10 to 20 mid-majors. They don't take open submissions. Now, they say that they have what they call a slush pile, and you can submit stuff, but basically no one ever gets published at a major publisher if you just submit directly to their slush pile. What you have to do is you have to find a book agent, and that book agent has to agree to represent you. And then the book agent will help you write a book proposal. And then they take that proposal, they shop it around to editors at the major publishing houses, and the editors then decide if they wanna take a meeting with you, get to know you better and get to know the book a little bit better, and then potentially offer you a book deal. That's generally how it works. Now, if you get offered a book deal, you, they, uh, the way it usually works is, they offer you an advance on royalties. So it can be anywhere from $50,000 upwards of a million plus, depending on various factors. I mean, the main factor is the expectation they're gonna sell a million dollars worth of copies or $50,000 worth of copies. Now, what the advance is, it's literally an advance on royalties, right? So, but what's weird about it is you don't have to pay this back. So if you get a $100,000 advance, if you only sell 10 books, you don't have to pay that money back to the publisher. That's kind of the good thing about advances. The bad thing about advances is that you no longer own the book, you no longer own the royalties, and you're only taking a small percentage of the royalties now, right? And the, the idea is the traditional publisher is investing this money in you and in the production of the book, and they're using their contacts to get it into bookstores and things like that, and so they get to take the majority of the sales. Let's walk through the major things you have to think about for traditional. For ownership and rights in traditional publishing, the publishing company always owns the print license, right? That means that they have the right to print this book in all mediums, electronic, physical, excerpts, all that sort of stuff. But with major tra publishing houses, the author always retains the copyright. All other rights tend to be negotiable, movie rights, excerpt rights, uh, things like that. The royalty rate is standard. With a traditional deal, you would get the same royalty rate that Stephen King gets. It's 15% hardcover, 7.5% trade paperback, and 5% mass market. Mass market are those little books in the grocery store. Trade paperbacks are normal paperbacks, and then hardcover, hardcover. Um, uh, the writing tends to entirely fall on you, on the author. Uh, that you'll get a little bit of editing help from your editor sometimes, and then the publishing house generally does the copy editing. The, the, the publisher will do all the publishing services, meaning the book cover, the interior layout, things like that, but the quality can vary widely depending on how, uh, how good they think your book is and the house you're at. Um, they, they do all distribution, and normally, with traditional publishing deals, your book is going to be in bookstores. It used to be guaranteed. That's changed a little bit. Now, for most authors, they're gonna get you in a few bookstores uh, and see if your book sells, and if it doesn't, then you're pretty much out of luck. If it does, then they go for wider distribution. Uh, now, of the three different models, traditional publishing has the highest, still has the highest prestige uh, and, and the highest sort of, um, uh, the best perception, but that's fading a lot, and it's not relevant at all to readers. It, mainly, it's just relevant to authors who think that they have to be traditionally published to be accepted or or validated 
Although I would tell you that it's funny. It used to be that self-publishing was considered um, vanity publishing and, and traditional was considered real. I actually think it's shifted a lot. I think traditional is now really considered vanity because it's so easy to publish self now and it's you're totally capable of producing a, a high level book just as good as anything you can do with a traditional publisher and you can own the rights. So if you're going to a traditional publisher now, a lot of times um, the reason is vanity. You want to feel validated. It's kind of funny how that shifted in the last 20 years. Now the time to publish a book generally takes about a year to three years depending on uh, uh, the publisher, how excited they are about the book, and how how close to being finished with the book you are. The so the advantages are you get a monetary advance before publishing. It's the highest. Generally, if you're with a traditional publisher, you have the highest potential for traditional media coverage. So most media don't care who publishes your book, just like no reader cares. But old school media still cares who publishes your book, which makes sense, right? If you've spent your life thinking that the media establishment matters. And you, if you work at the New York Times, you think the media establishment matters, and so you think that being published by Hachette is more valid than not. So, um, But with almost all non-mainstream or non-big New York media, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, the third advantage is that you, you can signal, you get a certain level of social signaling, you can feel accepted and validated if that matters to you. And the fourth advantage is you're gonna get possible bookstore placement. Now, the disadvantages are, are pretty pretty big. Um, it's extremely hard to get a deal. Uh, that's kind of the part I didn't talk about, is that a lot of uh, authors will say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go traditional. <laughs> you, you don't just decide you're going traditional. Um, the only way you're going to get a deal, basically, the way that traditional publishing works today, is you have to have a large audience that is waiting to buy your book. And you have to be able to convince a traditional publisher that you are going to sell generally 25,000 copies. That's pretty much the minimum before they're even going to think about publishing you. Because in their minds, if you don't have an audience of 25,000 waiting to buy your book, it's not worth their time and investment. So let me make this clear. I'm not just saying you need 25,000 people following you on Twitter. Nowhere near good enough. Because all 25,000 are not buying from you. You need 25,000 people who are waiting to buy your book, like who have money, who are ready to give it to you the day the book comes out. And if you cannot convince a traditional publisher that you have 25,000 people ready to buy your book, you're not going to get a deal or the, the odds are extremely low. The second drawback is it's a huge time investment. Finding an agent, pain in the ass. Doing a book proposal is almost as hard and complex as writing the book itself. Getting a deal is difficult. Then you've got to write the book, then going through the process, then uh, of, of publishing with them, and then waiting for it to come out. Uh, you're looking at, if you were to start today from zero, you'd be really lucky to have your book published and out on the market in 18 months. That'd be fast. Two years is still pretty speedy. Three years is more realistic. So it's a massive investment of time before you see any return, really. Third drawback, you don't own the book. This is a big deal for most business people and entrepreneurs. Not owning the book means that you don't just get to give it away. You can't use it in your marketing the way you want. You can't, um, you have to pay for every copy. It's a big pain in the butt. You can't just use the content in it any way you want. Publisher will not allow that. So when you don't own the book, it changes the dynamic. So the fourth drawback is loss of marketing control. Now, this is a big, big deal. Most of the people that are watching this course are entrepreneurs, business people, consultants, coaches, people who in some way, shape, or form are using this book to help get them, raise their visibility, get them clients, uh, things like that. Right? In addition to writing a great book that helps people, they want the book to help them. Publisher doesn't care about that. Publisher only cares about selling copies of the book. In fact, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive. The publisher's goals are often in direct contradiction to yours as the author. Uh, now look, it's not that you don't want to sell copies, but for most of our authors, selling copies is a secondary thing. First, they want the book to help them get them help get them business, right? or help their business, or help get them speaking, or whatever. Publisher does not care. 
They will not in any way, shape, or form market the book in that uh, way. They will not, not only will they not help you, they will often stand in your way. Uh, so if, just be very, very careful uh, about these trade offs. The fifth big uh, sort of drawback is you have no uh, creative or content control. Now, publishers are not evil. They're not going to go through and make you look bad in your book. But at the same time, they don't care about you. They care about selling copies of your book. And so, if, uh, for example, we see this all the time with authors who work with us at Scribe. They decide to work with us instead of a traditional publisher. The ones who can get deals, which is still a tiny, tiny sum, often decide to go uh, to work with us instead or, or to publish with us instead. And the reason is because they want to fully control the positioning of their book, right? A great example is uh, Ben Bergeron. He is a, a famous CrossFit coach. He coaches elite sort of athletes. He could have gotten a traditional deal. And the reason he didn't is because they wanted him to write a book that he didn't want to write. He wanted to write a different book uh, over a different topic that just quite frankly did not have the commercial appeal that the book the publisher wanted him to write. He didn't care. He wanted to write his book, he worked with us. Uh, so, which is fine, there's not a right or wrong answer here. But a lot of times the, com the commercial appeal of a book actually works in contraindication to the business appeal. Another example, our very first client, Melissa Gonzalez. She talked to traditional publishers, she had interest, but they all wanted her to write a book, a general broad book about retail. She didn't want to do that. She specializes in pop-up retail. They didn't want her to write a book on pop-up retail because it's a very small niche. You know, a few thousand people at most were ever going to buy this book. It wasn't worth their time. So she decided to publish with us instead. It worked out really well for her. It's driven millions of dollars of business to her consultancy. Um, and now they were right. She's only sold about a thousand copies of her book, but she's made millions because the few people who care about pop-up retail have uh, uh, write big checks and they are deeply interested and they go find her. So it's not, one's, it's not that one's right or wrong, they're just different. The sixth downside is that going with a traditional publisher limits your financial upside. So if you have a book that you think can actually do really well, especially one that doesn't need sort of uh, mainstream coverage, then by going with a traditional publisher, you're limiting your upside. They are taking the majority of the profits off the book. Furthermore, if the book is a piece of a larger media push, where let's say you're selling courses or other sort of coaching, they're not gonna necessarily try and take a back end on that, um, but at least the reputable publishers won't. Some of the low end publishers will try and do that, uh, and so you need to be very careful that. Publishers like Wiley will try and do that. But um, what you need to worry about here is they will not let you do the book you want to lead uh, into the funnel to create sort of the back end upside. Uh, so it kind of ties into creative content control as well. But um, they can they will they won't do it maliciously, but publishers will often screw up your book in terms of how it relates to the rest of your business life. Now there's a few questions you have to ask before you really even understand if you can get a traditional publishing deal and if it's right for you. The main one I kind of alluded to earlier is can you even get a deal? The reality is most authors cannot get a publishing deal, so let, let me walk through why. First off, finding a book agent to represent you and your idea is hard. Most agents get thousands of inbound requests a week, uh, or maybe a month actually. Um, writing a book proposal, like I said, is a huge task. In fact, we charge we do proposals for some of our authors who have big audiences who, for whom going traditional might make sense. We charge $15,000 for a proposal, which is almost half what we charge to do the entire book. That's how complicated and intricate proposals can get. Uh, the third problem is that shopping the book around to, uh, to publishers through the agent is difficult. Then you've gotta have an, a publisher make you an offer, which is by no means guaranteed then you've got to negotiate and accept that offer. So it's there's a lot, there's a big barrier. I would say of every 100 authors that come to us that want to go traditional or thinking about it legitimately, less than five even have a shot. And I would say maybe two have a realistic shot. Two. So we're looking at one to two percent. Uh, now, here's a great way to tell if you've got a realistic shot. 
and I said this earlier, do you have 25,000 people waiting to buy your book? Not you, not that you think will buy your book. Meaning, do you have an email list of, let's say, 100,000 where you have a open rate of 50% and you have a, a previously proven buy rate in the 20 to 20 to 30% range? If you have that, they want to talk to you and you can probably get a deal. Not a high one. You're looking at anywhere from 150 to 300,000, give or take, depending on the subject and, and other factors. Um, if you have social media followings multiple across different platforms, Facebook, Instagram, etc. If you have social media followings that are highly responsive in the 500,000 plus, then uh, you're potentially looking at a deal depending on what field you're in. For example, you want to do a cookbook, it's pretty easy to get a deal. You want to do a book about memes, you're not getting a deal. <laughs> it very much depends on, on the field. Um, but uh, you have to think of it from the publisher's perspective. They don't care about you. They don't care about your book. They just care if it's going to sell copies. So they need to know before they bet on you, you have 25,000 people that are waiting to buy your book. Now, the next question you need to answer is, uh, even if you can get a traditional deal, which only, let's say, 2% of you can, should you even take it? That's not an obvious question. Now, as recently as 20 or 25 years ago, this was a no-brainer. Of course you took it because you didn't really have any other options to get a book out into the public and in stores unless you went traditional. But the game has substantially changed since then. And in 2018, there's really only three reasons you would want to sign with a traditional publisher if you're offered a deal. Number one is you need the advance they're going to pay you. So let's say uh, that you have a big audience they're, they, they're confident you can sell even 50,000 copies, right? So uh, 50,000 copies, you can probably get a, an advance of two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, right? So let's say you get a two hundred fifty thousand dollar advance. If that advance is like you need that money, if it's just absolutely crucial, then yeah, then it probably makes sense to take it because look, it is you're getting that money. and as long as you deliver them a book, they can never come take it back. The second type of person who should take a traditional deal is the person, the type of person that must have mainstream media attention for the book to be successful. So um, when I say mainstream, I mean sort of established old media, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, places like that. Those are the only sort of places that still care who publishes your book. And the type of people who fall into this category are the type of people who don't own their audience, right? Who don't have permission assets to, to their audience, like an email list or a big social following or something like that. That generally means politicians, celebrities, athletes, musicians, people like that who do have a following, but they don't really control the message to the following. Those sorts of people, um, I think, tend to do well with traditional publishing because they can, first off, they can get a deal. They uh, can usually get a good advance and it makes, they, they kind of do need the stamp of being with a traditional publisher. But for most people, business people, people like that, doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'm going to get into that a little later. The third reason that you would take a deal if you could get one is that you want the, the sort of feeling of acceptance and validation that comes from being picked. Being honest, this is the main reason that most people want to deal uh, with a traditional publisher. And they, they feel like they're picked, they feel like they've um, leveled up, they feel like they've been validated. We've worked with a lot of authors who've gotten traditional deals. They'll, they'll, do their, they'll use uh, our manuscript process to do the book, and then they will then hand the book essentially to a traditional publisher and publish it. And um, most of them, not all, so like some of them like Tiffany Haddish, love the process. She'll, if she ever does another book, she'll do it with a traditional publisher, but that makes sense. She's a comedian and a celebrity, makes total sense for her. We had others like Joey Coleman, who um, he didn't have a bad experience, but he's not sure he ever wants to go traditional again. And Joey will tell you a lot of the reason he went with it was he wanted to feel like he was now in that traditional club. He did it once. He, his book hit Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, but there were a lot of downsides. And all the downsides I told him about were all there. And he made the trade-off consciously and willingly. So that's fine. So um, it's something you really, really need to think about, about whether the sort of social uh, 
uh, signal is worth all the downsides. For most people, it is not. For some people, it is. So that's actually the third question about answering whether traditional is worth it, is are the trade-offs of traditional uh, worth it or not? So let, let's kind of go in depth a little bit. Big, the biggest trade-off, like I said, is that you don't own the rights and royalties anymore. That's literally what you're selling a traditional publisher. Um, you're selling them control of your intellectual property. I would tell you that if you are in the business of selling your ideas, having someone else own your intellectual property is a disaster. It's a really bad idea for almost any coach or consultant or entrepreneur or business executive or lawyer or financial advisor. I would tell you the more you own your ideas, the better. But again, it's a trade-off. If you decide that the benefits of traditional outweigh owning the intellectual property of that book, okay. I mean, that that's kind of what Joey did. He wanted the imprimatur of, of traditional publishing. He thought it would be relevant to him in the circles that he he played in. He's found out it really wasn't that big of a deal. But again, I, I don't want to make it seem like that this is a right or wrong thing. It really just depends on what you value more, what business you're in, and how you're going to use your intellectual property. So the second big thing you need to really think about is your loss of creative and content control. Once you, like, you understand, once you take a deal from a publisher, they own the entire book, they own all the content, they get to decide everything that goes in the book, right? They final say over every word, the book title, the book cover, your bio, everything. Now, like, they're not bad people. They're not going to try and screw you. But I can tell you <laughs> that publishers, t- I mean, I've been through this process many times. Publishers tend to make terrible aesthetic decisions. Most of the people who work at publishing houses wanted to be writers and either didn't have the ability or the skill or the courage to do it. And so they work in that business. And when you hear their thoughts, you know why they don't have books of their own often. That's unfair to the very best ones, but the very best ones are a rare minority in that group. And most of them will want to make really bad changes and changes that will be detrimental to your content and to your image. But furthermore, even if they don't do any of that, even if they give you free reign, and the reality is if you fight hard enough, most of the time publishers will capitulate. So I don't want to make it seem like they're, they're just out to screw you because it's not. They, they're doing their best. They're just not that skilled often um, or certain people in publishing companies tend not to be that skilled. But um, even if they, they leave you alone and let you do anything you want in your book, you don't own the, the content. You don't own the creative and you don't get to market it the way you want. So you, you can't, for example, give a PDF of your book away for free to potential clients. You can't take content out and excerpt it other places uh, without paying a fee to publishers. You can't give copies of your book away for free. For example, huge numbers of our clients that could have gotten traditional deals did not because they were already doing, let's say, 20 speaking events a year, making anywhere from 15 to 25 grand. And what they wanted to be able to do was pay their fee, raise their fee to 30 or 40 or 50 grand, but, you know, like kind of raise their fee and then uh, justify that by giving a thousand books, for example, to the conference or the event. Well, if you are working with a traditional publisher, you can't give anything away. You have to buy those books from the traditional publisher. And if you're lucky, they'll let you buy them at wholesale price, which means half off. So you're paying $12 a copy. But if you own the book, then you can buy from the printer at print cost. And at scale, hardcovers cost $2 a copy. So let's say you're getting paid 35 grand from Microsoft to do a keynote there and they want a thousand books. Well, a thousand books from a traditional publisher, that's basically your entire fee, nearly your entire fee. Thousand books if you self published, two grand, nothing. So it's, it's a very clear marketing decision and a very clear financial decision if you're using your book and the content in your book to market and promote yourself. But publishers don't care about that. They only care about selling copies. And beyond that, they they have complete control over price. They have complete control over marketing. If they want to position the book a certain way uh, that doesn't appeal to the group you want to appeal to, you're out of luck. Nothing you can do. They own the book. They paid you for it. That's it. The two other big things that we talked about too, huge time investment. 
Again, you work with a company like us, we can have you from idea to publish book in seven months. Uh, you work with a traditional publisher, even if you do the manuscript with us, you're still looking at 18 months usually before it's published. And so like that's a that's not a fast enough turnaround for a lot of people. The And now the other big thing too is bookstore placement. A lot of, lot of people think, oh, well, I'll be in bookstores, traditional publisher. It's not, not really going to happen. So first, let me break this down. Right now, I believe about 50% of the book market are physical books, right? The other 50%, I could be off about 5% one way or the other, but about half the book market is ebook, half is uh, uh, physical. And if you count audio, which is a huge thing now, the, the, as part of the book market, uh, physical goes from, from half to under 40%. Um, now, of the physical book market, so let's just let's just stick with the actual printed text of that market. Um, let's call fifty percent physical. Twenty, about half of those are sold in bookstores. So you're looking at twenty five percent of t- the total book market, excluding audio, is sold in books uh, bookstores. Now that's not that's all books, right? And the books work on a power law, so. Most, almost all the books, 80, 90% of the books sold in bookstores are the best, big bestsellers. Mostly huge novels, the, you know, two or three big nonfiction books that come out every month, you know, something by Adam Grant, something by Malcolm Gladwell, whatever, uh, and cookbooks and books like that. That's the vast majority. Most nonfiction, and we have worked with so many dozens just in this company alone of authors who've done traditionally published books. When you break down the numbers, they'll sell 10 books, 20 books a month in bookstores. The ones that get into bookstores. 10 or 20 books a month in a bookstore. It's essentially a useless, useless uh, uh, endeavor for mid-list or back-list authors. Makes no sense at all. And what the, the vision that most business people have is, oh, but my book will be in bookstores, uh, airport bookstores. It won't. You have to pay for that. Like you, every book you see in an airport bookstore is there for one of two reasons: either it is selling really, really well on its own, so the airport bookstore puts it in because they're making money, or the person paid for that slot. It's called co-op, and they pay anywhere from ten to sixty thousand dollars a month to have your book on front shelves or just in shelves in bookstores, airport bookstores especially, but also Barnes and Noble does co-op as well. The bookstore game is a total racket. Even if you go with a traditional book, uh, uh, comp, uh, a traditional publisher, even if your book is, they tell you it's one of their big ones, you're lucky if you'll be, you're in half of bookstores and you're probably will be in no bookstores after a year. So if your big thing is bookstores, first off, I would let it go. And second, I would highly, highly consider not, um, not working with traditional publishers. All right, self-publishing. The main crux of the self-publishing model is that the author retains ownership of their book and they manage and control the whole process. The self-publishing has many different forms, but at its core, the author either does the publishing work themselves or manages freelancers or or a publishing services company that do the work for a fee. Um, That's kind of the core thing, is that no, uh, no one's paying you for the rights to publish the book. You're doing it yourself. So there's no acceptance needed, no advance. You retain all rights. You don't have to ask permission. You just go and do it. So to kind of run down how it works. uh, Author retains all rights and and royalties. Uh, The royalty rate varies. Uh, It can be 100% if you sell the books yourself. It can be 70%, which is uh, the standard rate on Amazon. But it depends on what distributor you use or how you sell the books. There's no advance against royalties, obviously, because no one's paying you. You own the book. You're publishing it. Uh, The writing, the author manages. Uh, There's many variations of help you can get, like working with our company, hiring freelance editors, etc., but all are paid, unless your friends help you for free. Um, The publishing services, uh, you've got to manage it yourself. You either do it yourself or you pay someone to do it for you or you manage people working with you. Uh, the distribution, again, author must manage. Lots of variations. Standard one is Amazon, iBooks, things like that. The marketing, is, the author must manage that. Many variations exist, but um, all are paid again. And then prestige and perception, it's very 
very uh, it varies widely, but it, it basically is totally dependent on the quality of the book, not just the interior, but the exterior, which we're going to talk about. And then the time to publish can be very quick, actually. It can be weeks uh, if you really dedicate your time and really get it out fast. Now, the advantages of self-publishing include full ownership of rights and royalties, completely customizable, fast to market, total marketing control, total creative control, total freedom in all aspects. You answer to no one. The drawbacks are it's a lot of work if you want to get it right. Not a lot of work if you want to do a bad job obviously, but who wants to do that? Um, if it's unprofessional, it's going to result in poor quality and low status. You're going to look bad if you do an unprofessional book. Uh, the time It's time consuming to learn and manage the process yourself. Uh, but Now that you can solve that problem by hiring great people to do it for you, but then it becomes expensive. So that's sort of the trade-off. Now, the questions to ask. Can you do a professional job uh, deciding whether or not to do self-publishing or not? The, the questions you need to ask yourself. The first one is, can you do a professional job? Like this is the most crucial job in self-publishing. It basically trumps all the rest. If you believe you can do a professional job publishing uh, your book, or you can pay someone to do a professional job, then self-publishing is almost always the best bet. Now the reason, but if you can't, if you can't do a professional job, if if either you don't have the time or the money, then uh, self-publishing is not a good option. It, for a lot of people, y you're better off not having a book than having a bad book. And doing a bad job on self-publishing will give you a bad book. Now, the reason is this is so crucial is because think about how you judge a book. Like, how do you judge a book? You hear the title, you make a judgment whether or not it's for you. You look at the cover, you make a judgment about the book based on the cover. You read the author bio. You look at the author photo. You read the book description. You read the reviews. All those things, you've made immense judgments about the book before you've ever even opened it. In fact, most people, more than 80%, don't open a book or read anything in the book before they make a decision about whether or not to buy the book. And uh, they make a decision about the author. They judge the author based on all of those things first. Now, once they start reading the book, then think about all the ways that they uh, judge the book, that you judge a book. Um, is it well written? Am I taking value from it? Are there spelling errors? Are there grammar errors? Is it well formatted? All of those things have to be dialed in and they have to be done well for your book to be, um, to be, like, to be professional. And if they're not, you will look bad. Think about, have you ever read a book and seen a spelling error? you almost instinctually think the author is dumb, which of course is irrational. I mean, it's a, you have a 400 page book or a 200 page book, it's impossible to not have at least some, one thing in there that's at least debatable uh, uh, grammatically. Uh, and of course, like, uh, come on, the smartest people on earth misspell words all the time, but you still think the person is stupid if there's a misspelling. You gotta be very, very careful with that. The same goes with the cover. If the cover is poorly designed, you think you basically assign a social class. You make a judgment on the author based on their cover. If it looks really well designed and professional, you think, oh, <clears throat> they must they must be smart. They must be high status. If it looks like they paid five dollars for it um, off of you know Upwork, you're like, oh, they must be cheap or they must not know better. You got to be very careful. Now, the second question you need to, to, to ask to determine if self-publishing is right for you. What's the trade-off, right? So the trade-off is to do a professional book with self-publishing, you either must put in time or money or in some cases both, right? Um, it is not hard to do all the steps necessary to do a professional book. This entire course lays them out. It just takes time. If you don't have that time, then you need to pay someone. And if you don't have that money, who does know how to do it? And if you don't have that money, I would tell you not to do the book. Like I said, there's a saying in movies that really applies to books. Good, cheap, fast, pick two, right? So you can do good and cheap, it's gonna be slow, because you're gonna have to do it, right? And, and you can find even some good people to work with you who are cheap, it's gonna be hard to find them, and you're gonna have to manage them a lot. Good and fast, gonna be expensive. 
because you need professionals. And then you don't want bad and cheap or bad and fast. <laughs> like those, are, those are kind of not options. So it's, it's like pick good and then do you want cheap or fast? I would tell you if you have the money, use the money to buy your time and work with good professionals. Now let's talk about hybrid publishing. Hybrid is sort of in between traditional and self. And it's called hybrid because you are working with a publishing company, but um, it, the, the work you do with them has a lot of attributes of self-publishing. Uh, honestly, I think this is the worst model, and I never, never recommend publishers go with hybrid. In my opinion, hybrid kind of gets you the worst of traditional publishing and the worst of self-publishing. But let me explain the model because there are a few very rare numbers of authors for whom it makes sense. And I want to explain it to make sure you understand it so God forbid a hybrid publisher tries to sell you some bullshit otherwise. So the basic idea here is that you work with a publishing company. They, instead of, um, but instead of paying a big advance like a traditional publisher, they'll either pay no advance or a small advance and they will give you a higher share of the royalties uh, and they'll give you uh, sometimes a lot more control in the process. Um, and then the, the sort of what they do is they do a lot of the publishing work, right? So like the layout and the cover design, et cetera, right? So um, the ownership and rights can, so to walk down sort of the, the, the important things, ownership and rights are variable. The royalty rate varies a lot. It can be anywhere from 25, 15 to 25% to as high as 50%. Um, the advance is usually very small. Most of the time there's no advance. Usually no help with writing, sometimes help with editing, but that's uncommon. They usually do some publishing services, um, usually all of them, but not always. Distribution, they usually do some of that. Marketing help is very variable, it depends on the company and the deal. And the prestige and per uh, perception, it's really about the same as self-publishing. It's not much different because most no one's heard of, of hybrid publishing houses. And so the only really prestige it gets you, uh, the traditional gets you, no one's is because people know the names. No one knows the name of hybrid publishers. Now the time to publish can vary again widely. It can be six months to two years. Totally depends on the house. So here's the questions you should ask yourself before you hybrid publish. Why pick hybrid over the other two? Uh, again, I don't think there's a reason. <laughs> um, it, it's sort of like traditional has its positives and negatives but you're solidly on one side of the road. Self has its positives and negatives, but you're also, you're solidly on the other side of the road. Hybrid kind of keeps you in the middle. And what happens when you're in the middle of the road? You get hit, right? Um, so here's what you have to understand about the model. Uh, basically, why hybrid exists is because you have people who kind of know how publishing works and they're arbitraging their knowledge of how to turn a manuscript into a book to essentially try and take some of the profits from authors. Um, they don't wanna say they're doing that. They say they love books and they say they're helping people and they might believe all of that. But the reality is they are trying to project to authors that you will get all the benefits of traditional with none of the downsides. That's not true. We all know that in a world where you know you don't have to have any trade-offs, that's, that's heaven, right? That doesn't exist. Um, uh, so I would be highly, highly suspicious. Again, uh, most of the time you don't own the rights, you don't own the royalties, at least in terms of like, you can't give the book away for free. You can't use it in marketing the way you want all those sorts of things. You're not going to be able to do because the only way hybrid publishers make money is by you selling copies of your book. The, there are some hybrid publishers now that are, are trying to do kind of quasi 360 deals. Well, they'll like, they, they'll take a piece of your speaking or they'll take a piece of other things. I would run as fast away from those companies as you can. They're just they're just in a cash grab. They're just trying to take money. Uh, none of them do anything for you that I've heard of yet. Uh, none of them are any good. The, the, I know a few company, they're not really public companies. I know a few tiny boutique agencies that will reach out to authors and that will build their entire platform. Uh, but you can't apply to work with those companies. They're not not—they're not public. They're just total ballers who turn authors they think can be stars into stars and then they split all the revenue. Those are not, those are not the companies you're going to, to see in hybrid publishing. The other big problem too um, 
is that a lot of hybrid publishers will try and own copyright, which is a big, big deal. Traditional publishing, they'll own the print license, but they always reserve copyright for the author, which means if they ever take the book out of print, that essentially the rights revert back to you, the author. Hybrid publishers will try and own the copyright as well, meaning that they own your IP forever. That is extremely problematic. It's even worse than traditional publishing. Um, there's, there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on in hybrid publishing with that. I would be highly suspicious. Anyone who's promising you they're going to make you a ton of money, the reason is because they're going to make more, right? I would generally stick to either traditional or go with, if you have a, a good book and you have money, go with a an experienced publishing services company who will take a fee up front, but they don't try and own your stuff because you know they're going to do a good job because they're judged by the quality of the work they do, which is like Scribe. That's like my company. That's why we do a great job for authors because that's how we're judged. Um, but we're not trying to own your stuff going forward. They're very different things. There's some common questions to, to ask to help you pick the publishing mo uh, model you're going to use. The first one is, I want my book to establish my authority and credibility in my field. What option do I pick? So most people would tell you uh, traditional publishing. And I, like I said, that's true if you're a celebrity or an athlete or a musician or an academic or a professional writer or someone else who's already famous or you have a clear social group that you're trying to signal to that values traditional publishing. But if you are in business, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a coach, if you are a consultant, if you're a thought leader, if you're an expert, for almost all of those sorts of people, people that are using the book to promote them or their business or raise their visibility or anything like that, I would actually recommend highly professional self-publishing because it gets you the benefit of owning all of your IP and total control over content and marketing and it like it, there's almost no actual uh, increase in prestige with traditional publishing. Like we'll get a lot of times authors who come to us who are trying to decide between us and traditional. And first off, most of them can't get traditional deals. But even if they can, um, they think if they get a traditional deal, they'll be covered in the New York Times. No, traditional publishing does something like fifty thousand books a year. How many get covered in the New York Times? Two dozen? Four dozen? No. Like extremely small numbers. And those are almost all from already famous writers or celebrities or what all the people I told you should do traditional publishing. If you are a baller financial planner in Houston, Texas, you're not getting covered in the New York Times. Not because of your book. It doesn't make any sense. There's no angle there. Uh, what you should do is use your book to, to find your audience, not try and uh, uh, get in the New York Times because you're not going to. So I would really, really look at, um, for authority and credibility, look at professionalism and quality of your book as opposed to who published it. Next question. I want to be in bookstores. Which option do I pick? Most people will tell you that traditional is the only way to do that. That's not exactly true. First off, again, like I said, traditional publishers will not place you in bookstores other than in major cities on your release date unless they've already, uh, they're convinced you're going to sell a lot of copies. And here's the thing too, it's not up to the publisher to decide whether you get in bookstores. It's up to the bookstores. The bookstores decide what books to buy. And publishers, every, every quarter, they send their sales reps out to Barnes & Noble and to independent bookstores and from every publisher. And they'll have their little catalog and they'll have, let's say, 100 books in their catalog that they're pushing. They'll have 400 they're publishing. They'll have 100 they're pushing hard. And the sales rep's job, their quota, is to get at least 80% of that 100. And then like 10% of the ones of the, the larger catalog, right? So if you're lucky, if a publisher's lucky out of 400 books, they're getting, you know, 80 to 100 placed in a bookstore, right? So there's no guarantees with traditional publishing. And like I said, if the book doesn't sell immediately, even the bookstores you get in, they're out. The other thing to think about as well is that hybrid publishers also claim they can get you into bookstores. It's much harder for them. They have a much harder uphill fight because they don't have uh, Hachette. A traditional publisher can, can use pricing power. They can say, okay, if you want this massive book that you know is going to sell 
from James Patterson, you have to take these 50 other novels from people we think are going to be big or something. Uh, hybrid publishers don't have that. They don't have big, uh, big books like that. They basically have to beg, borrow, and steal. So hybrid publishers telling you they're going to get into bookstores, they're almost always lying. Uh, there's a few hybrid publishers who have some success at that. But again, they just have success with books, a few books, not with their whole list. Um, now, uh, look, here's the thing with bookstores. At this point in history, it's an ego play. I don't think it leads to sales, and I don't think it leads to credibility, and the data backs that up. The last question, I want my book to promote my business. Which option do I pick? I would hope at this point, this is obvious, you pick self-publishing. Uh, the flexibility to position your book the way you want and the ability to, to, to do it as professionally as you need, no question. Self-publishing is the best option. You just have to work with really high-level people.